the warrior for reason, Matt Dillahunty. <laughs> All right. Hello. I can hear that there are people here, and it's always better when people show up. Uh, hello, New York. Thank you guys for coming out. I, uh, I am touring now with the magic and skepticism thing, but tonight's going to be special. Uh, I'm not actually going to do any of the magic stuff that I was going to do. Um, but if you want to see something later, you know, I can pull my finger off or whatever you want. Uh, I am very fortunate tonight. We've been doing uh, a number of special events in addition to the magic and skepticism. Uh, this event, and a huge thank you to Pangburn Philosophy for putting this on and a number of the other events. You can give them a round of applause. <laughs> I, I'm very keen on focusing on skepticism and humanism um, this year and maybe next year and, and for the rest of my life. And running around doing this show, engaging in magic, something I've been passionate about since I was three, teaching skepticism, something that I became gradually more passionate about, encouraging humanism and humanist values has put me in a position where I am fortunate <laughs> enough to have great conversations with some people that I have never met. Uh, and tonight, I, I'm very happy to be joined uh, by a special guest who I literally met about three hours ago, right about the time that I tweeted, hey, it's three hours until we do this event. Uh, and I like this because sometimes when we announce the events, there are people who immediately <coughs> want to take sides or determine what the event's about. I did an event in Toronto with Jordan Peterson. And, People were like, wait, is, is Matt agreeing with Jordan and they're going to sit there? Or is Matt disagreeing with Jordan and they're going to debate? What is it, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? And uh, it turned out it was a, a conversation that I enjoyed. And I hope that tonight is even better. Um, he's come all the way over from Great Britain. He's the author of The Strange Death of Europe. There's copies out there for you. Please give an incredibly warm welcome to tonight's special guest, Douglas Murray. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you can't see any of them. No one is. I, I can like hear them. There's somebody in a white shirt that I can see, yes. <laughs> so yeah, we were at, at dinner talking, and I, we were talking about how to actually introduce you. And of course, you and I just met. So this is, the, this is our first date. Everybody gets to see us. Engage. We had an almost date before, because I was in the audience when you were in London with Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins, and That's right. Sam asked me as a guest, and I was there in the audience. So. And Sam didn't bother to introduce us at all at that, or we... We would have been able to do this before. Could have been fast friends longer than this. Uh, but we, we had a, a brief discussion about labels, about how do I... Uh, is this the... Uh, British neoconservative intellectual uh, talking head proponent of a think tank who uh, has his thoughts on uh, Islam and immigration and all this and, and you know, is an author of four books, soon to be five, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that led to, to some concern about labels that I think we share in many areas. Mm. By the way, in, in Britain, if you introduce somebody as an intellectual, it's death. Oh. Nothing. Nothing that kills, a, kills something more. I have no fear of being introduced like that anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, I am concerned about labels these days because um, we were talking before about the nature of the internet and, and that nobody expected it to go this way of like, unbelievable vitriol and, and rage and, and, and sort of grasping for short-term explanations for people. And, yeah, I, I'm a, a, political labels and indeed some religious labels uh, become really unhelpful uh, because they, they become a sort of way to not listen to somebody in advance. You know, so, some of it can be useful, obviously, but, but by this stage I kind of feel most political labels are a real problem. Yeah, I wonder how much of it is maybe... I, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to label people as, as excessively lazy or are frustrated, but I think that has to be a part of it where everything is a label. Every word we use is a label for some concept, and so we use this to communicate, and we're generally pretty good at it in the sense that we're not falling apart 
at the, at the roots of civilization. We're able to, you understand me, I understand you, even though I don't have that particular accent. Um, we've sorted it out a little bit. But when we talk about the labels that we put on broader concepts, what I find happens quite often is they're either used as a way to dismiss without any actual substantive sure. conversation, or they're used as a shorthand where you just assume the people you're talking to have the same understanding of the label that you do. Right. And that's not necessarily the case. No, I don't, and I don't want to labor the point, but transatlantic, it's not a consistent language about politics. Where I'm from, liberal means something different from what it means here, for instance. Uh, and there's all sorts of words like that that don't travel. But no, I mean, I think that generally uh, the... Uh, the problem of labels has been accentuated by social media, which has all sorts of advantages, has some serious drawbacks. And the main drawback, I mentioned this to Matt earlier, is that people who do the sort of things we do used to craft what we said and what we wrote in order to make sure, among other things, that a, an honest critic couldn't misunderstand us. And the strange thing about the era of social media and the internet is that you end up having to, gra uh, to craft what you say and write in order to try to make sure that a dishonest critic also can't misrepresent you. It's an almost impossible task, um, but one we're obviously trying to find our way through. It's, when, you, when it comes to the sorting out which are the honest critics and which are the dishonest critics, <laughs> I find that's actually getting more difficult as well because uh, while I pretend to read minds on stage, I can't actually read minds. And so if somebody um, comes after something I've said on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, I have to spend a great deal of time before I even decide if I'm going to respond or how I'm going to respond. Is this individual confused? Have I not crafted my message clearly enough? Yeah. Um, or is there some way I could reword the message to rehabilitate this individual, or are they one of the dishonest ones, the people who are they sometimes labeled the outrage brigade by right. my friend Seth? Uh, they're just never going to be happy no matter what you say, because you didn't say it exactly the way they wanted to yeah. in the time frame they wanted. Yeah, what I get is you, 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 didn't, you didn't say it all in the 60 seconds we gave you, <laughs> which if you're dealing with the meaning of life or something, it's often hard to hit that, that moment. Yes. It's in the, in the debates that I've often had with um, religious apologists, there's something called the Gish Gallop, which is named after Dwayne Gish, where the apologist will present 20 things that are wrong, right. each of which would take you an hour yes. to 10 hours to properly rebut. Yes. And then whichever ones you don't address, when it's their turn to speak next, they'll say, my opponent failed to address <laughs> points three, four, seven, and therefore I win. Yeah. Well, we, the, uh, the Times of London the other day reported on this Flat Earth Society that's now booming, uh, at least booming to the extent that Flat Earth Societies can for the time being. But I mean, they had, I, I don't know, they, they had a conference the other day in London, and they got like 300 Flat Earthers who all had these points about like the, the horizon, no one had actually been to it. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? And, I, and there was some amazing, amazing. Then they had T-shirts and things. You know, they obviously want people to know they're flat earthers and how dim they are. And <laughs> but the, you know, we weren't expecting that. We weren't expecting the flat earthers to get a boom in the foreseeable future. And yet there they are. I can remember years ago, and I don't know how many people here have watched watched a lot of episodes of the Atheist Experience, but. It, there was an episode where I basically said, well, nobody believes in, in the Greek gods anymore. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that was a mistake because yeah, yeah. the emails came in. It didn't come pouring in. They trickled in, but it was <laughs> still... What still did they say? They, they said, oh, you're wrong. I, I actually still do believe in the Greek gods. And I was like, oh, that's, that's a good joke. And then they were clearly offended and outraged that I would dismiss this as a, as a joke. And so I had a brief conversation with one of them. <laughs> uh, and it was, it's not worth it repeating. But t to be fair, I, it, it encouraged me to exercise more caution in right. making, you know, grandiose claims that nobody believes this anymore. Oh, yeah, somebody does. You sort of hope that they're in a terrible internecine war with people who still worship the Roman gods. You know, they just <laughs> go at it late at night. I, yes. I, it, well, it's just, I've done much the same thing with uh, Christian apologists on occasion. 
uh, there was a, an event where I had done a video about slavery, and every Christian apologist has a different pathway to try to rehabilitate the Bible's position on slavery. And so I was standing there with four of them, and they were all trying to rehabilitate this in a different way. Right. And so it was perfect because I just said, you four sort it out. When you figure out what the right answer is from God, <laughs> come back and I'll address that one. Because until you do, uh, I, I don't see any reason to address four different answers from God. Why, why hasn't he cleared this up already? Yeah. Uh, were, were there any plausible arguments from them? I don't know. I never heard back from them after they... <laughs> I, sus I suspect uh, that there was not agreement. At least they'd all agreed it was bad. And they were you, trying you to... You would hope so, but you <laughs> would be mistaken. Really? Because there are people who go down that road that say that once upon a time, it was perfectly moral and acceptable. And also, that because ultimately it was in the benefit of those who were enslaved because they now had access to the true religion that they didn't have access to before. Right. God, it's a hell of a way to get it. Isn't it? I would... <laughs> it's, uh, it's the worst route there. Yeah, salvation at gunpoint, I yeah. guess, kind of. We, uh, there's, well, there's one question that I was asked to ask you, so, so I might get that out of the way. Uh, because it might tie into a few things. Uh, a, an internet fr friend of mine wanted me to ask why you encouraged atheists in Great Britain to go to church last Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, good question. We go straight into the deeps. Um, <laughs> well, obviously Britain where I'm from and uh, Europe more generally, uh, the situation with religion is, is different from the situation you have here. I mean, uh, there are all sorts of differences, all sorts of similarities, but we, we don't have in Britain a kind of any form of strong Christianity that I see as being any threat in the public sphere. I mean, our bishops are all basically on the verge of atheism, as far as I can see. If you get a bishop in Britain, I mean, the, the hardest thing to do is to, for them is to affirm what was their creed. You know, it's filled with sort of God as it were, you know. Um, so we have the sort of doubting bishop as a sort of perpetual part of the comedy of British life. Um, and so we don't have that assertive form of religion which can still exist here and in certain states is very strong. Um, and I think it's partly, I, I write a bit about this quite a bit in this recent book, I, I think that we are in a very strange place in, in Europe, in Britain, uh, in our relation to faith. And for all sorts of reasons of which we can get into, um, we are in this situation that a wonderful French philosopher called Chantal de Soul described as being in the situation that Icarus would have been in if he'd survived the fall. Hmm. That is that by the time that the Cold War finishes in Europe, uh, we've dreamed all of these religious dreams and they've all crashed. We've dreamed all of these political dreams, including two big ones in the 20th century that turned out to be n global nightmares. So that by the time the last of those falls, we are on the ground, wounded, burnt, singed, badly bruised, and rather amazed to find that we're still here with this big question that then comes up, which is, what do we do? And again, I mean, this doesn't apply in quite the same way in this country as I see it. Which I think may be one of the reasons why this kind of question goes up, but I, I want to let you but, get through it. But I suppose one of the things I feel, and I, I know a lot of people now in Europe from the political left, right, center ground, atheists, non-atheists, and so on, who, who are starting to worry. And I suppose the worry, for me, condenses into this, which is the increasing fear that the Enlightenment didn't go very deep or very wide or very far and that it turns out not to be cherished by all that many people. And that what might come down the road might be so much worse. I put it no stronger for now than the, the nervousness. And since this is a situation we're in, I mean, I'm, I'm an atheist, I have been for many years, I don't believe in the little claims of the Bible or anything else, 
But I do recognize something which in Europe, at any rate, I see and I'm concerned about, which is what I regard as a vacuum. And one of the only interim answers I've been able to put forward is to say, we can accept the fact that we're atheists. We can accept the fact that we don't believe in literal truth and so on, and yet have to find a way to remind ourselves and each other of how we got to where we are. Because there's a whole set of things which I and others start to worry about. And, and one of the few ways I've found to try to explain this is to say that includes in engaging in parts of your past which you no longer believe in, at the very least to know how you got to where you are now. So I, don't say, I didn't say in that piece that people should go to church and praise the risen Lord, but to say to them, at least engage in the thing that got you to the place you are now and know how it happened. Let me put it another way very quickly. Uh, one of the most striking things, that uh, there's a, a British uh, rabbi called Jonathan Sachs, who has some position here in New York as well. Some years ago, I said to him, a slightly impertinent question, but I said, um, Rabbi Sachs, I know quite a lot of your congregation <laughs> in London, and um, how can I put this, but um, they all seem to be atheists, or at least a, a lot of them. And without missing a beat, he said, oh, most of them, I'd have thought. And I said, and I, you could see I was sort of slightly thrown. And I said, well, well what, what do you take from that? And he, he replied rabbinically with a, a non-answer. He said, but he said, this year, 98% of British Jews will be celebrating the holidays. And I, this is just an interest, interesting way through a bit of this, it seems to me. A accepting the realities of where we are. But... Um, not, not casting people into it, particularly the people you and I both know and have come across, who find the position, once they arrive there, of atheism to be a very lonely place. And I just, as I say, it's not an answer to the whole thing, but as an interim thing, to say at least remain engaged in all of this idea and all of this past, engage with it. I think I, think I might understand what, what some of the confusion and concern is, and the, the, I suspected some of this is you know, differences on either side of the pond. Mm. And for me, not having grown up in Britain, suffocated by Church of England, uh, and it's largely atheistic irrelevancy, I find it strange that you're, t you're talking to a rabbi who says that 98% of Jews are going to be celebrating the holidays. I'm assuming he's talking about Christmas. Oh, no, no, he's talking about the Jewish holidays. He's talking about the Jewish yeah. holidays. And yet, we know that, uh, studies have shown that 50% of Jews in Israel are secular. Sure. And Reform Judaism doesn't require any belief in God. So, sure. we, we often make a mistake of talking about religion mm. as if it's one thing. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely false, um, because Judaism, even, if, even in its varieties, is already very different. You know, mm. Reform Judaism doesn't require a belief in a God. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, you get a rabbi that's not surprised that his congregation is largely atheist. And then you get conservative and Hasidic Jews that uh, I doubt very many sure. of those are atheists. And then you have the various varieties of Christianity. And it, w one of the questions that's come up quite often is, why is the view of religion in the, in the UK so much different from the way it is in the States. And I've, I've often heard it put forward that uh, this is an issue of a free market, where in the UK, because you have a state religion, there was no yes. competition to draw people in. And the United States, we had freedom of religion, right. and so they're in competition to market. Yes, I mean, let me give an example of that. Um, everybody in the UK lives technically in a parish. And that means that the priest in that parish could, even if you were a non-believer, uh, be responsible for your spiritual well-being, as for your funeral, for instance. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that everyone automatically gets a Church of England funeral, but it means that the, the default position is that the state church would, would be there. Whereas, I think if you were a Catholic, for instance, uh, if you were, sorry, if you w were an atheist and you died, your local Catholic church would not stake any claim for your religious rights. So there is a, yes, it, it, has, it has done something strange like that. The other thing is just that, uh, who knows, it, it, it's, it's just a lot more advanced in Europe for good and ill, but that, that they say that, well, the southern 
Mediterranean states, Italy, Catholic Church is very strong still, Spain very strong. So, you know, you have to draw up these distinctions within it. But basically in the Protestant parts of Europe, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's very little. They, they some time ago, I think, became basically the Green Party at prayer. Um, you know, I mean, I mean they, you know, they explain how important it is to tackle global warming and so on, which is all good, but it's, it's, it's not saying to people, you know, you have to affirm the creed, otherwise you're going to hell. I heard good things about Spain in the last few years, pulling away from the church and, and <laughs> instituting a, a far more secular government, yeah. uh, to the point where I joked that if my country became a theocracy, I'd go to Spain, because at least I had <laughs> two years of high school Spanish, which uh, it sets me up well, better. You know, the country that is most striking in is uh, Ireland. I first went to Ireland in my first book in uh, the late 90s, 2000s. And then uh, Ireland was still a very, very, I mean, it's the most, the most oppressively religious country in Europe I'd been to. Uh, the, 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 the Catholic Church had such a grip. Today, I don't think you could find a more secular country. It's really fascinating, and it's one thing in particular, which is a clerical abuse scandal, which has just turned the Irish people, understandably, against the whole thing. And, you know, to the extent that you know, a bishop now stands up and makes a moral pronouncement, and the Irish public want to do the opposite. You know, in fact, the Catholic Church, I can't remember what was in the abortion debate or the gay marriage. Yes, they sat out the gay marriage debate, basically, because they knew that if they came out against the public vote in the referendum would be even bigger for gay marriage. And, and the scandals, they go deep there. They're, they're oh, yeah. not just um, dealing with pederasts and child rapists. This was theft of children from unwed mothers yeah. and workhouses and yeah. just... Uh, uh, and in living memory. Yeah. Um, no, it's an extraordinary thing, but to see, a, to see a society shift that fast in 18 years or so, it's a remarkable thing. Which, which kind of sticks a pin in, in what, I, what everybody who knows me knows I've been and waiting to object to. If the fear is we're losing something, so as a, as a stopgap measure, go back to what got you here. I might have a slight issue with going back to what got us here if the place we are is that we're bleeding and bloody on the ground in sure. after, after the fall. But one of the things that the secular community in the United States has been doing, um, for the longest time, atheism in the United States was a bunch of guys that looked like me complaining about how much religion sucked and, and congratulating themselves for you know, getting the right answer to what I think is literally the easiest question, do I have enough reason to believe this? But as we move forward, and the, the, the percentage of the population that identify as nuns, the NONEs, uh, no religious preference and no religious identity, uh, we've started to do things like, well, actually, Sunday Assembly, I think, started in Britain, but it's here as well, an oasis, and we're building landing places mm -hmm. that are founded on principles of secular humanism, mm -hmm. um, which can serve as one potential you know, moral and virtue guiding principle, mm -hmm. um, but also create places for people to land when they find their way out of religion. Sure. And I, I, my, I'm happy to tell people, I, I go to church um, not for the reasons that you're suggesting, um, but I go to church more often than people would guess, because on the TV show, I want to make sure that I am not straw manning right. um, religious views. Do you ever so, get surprised when you do that? Not anymore. No. Um, there's been a massive change from when I was younger. I mean, I went to a Southern Baptist church primarily. I would occasionally go to Pentecostal churches because they had better co uh, concerts. I mean, they would have the, the Christian rock bands of Petra and Carmen and stuff, and they'd all come to those, those churches. So I liked those. The very words Christian rock band just made me kind of come goose pimply. <laughs> I, I feel the same way when I hear Christian magician, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's another, another story. But growing up in those kinds of churches, uh, I want to make sure that I'm not only relying on the version of Christianity right. that I grew up with, right. and that I'm not relying on something from 30 years ago. Yeah. So I'll, I will go to some of the churches. The mega churches, even, even most of the people I grew up with who... who you know, were religious, would look at most of the modern megachurches and say, well, that's, that's not Christianity. 
Right. Now, I don't get to say what is or isn't Christianity. That's for them to decide. Uh, but it is very much, you know, you don't get dressed up in your Sunday best anymore. You go in mm-hmm. jeans and a t-shirt, and you're singing rock songs that have been perhaps mildly converted to be a little bit more about a God. You know, it's, that some atheist on LSD wrote this song for the secular world, and the, and the church has managed to co-opt it, and they've co-opted the slogans from everything. You know, the, you'll have t-shirts of the, the McDonald's shirts, and they'll twist the McDonald's logo to be about Jesus and all this stuff. How do it, they do that? It is, it is... What? So, Seth Andrews, everybody loves Seth? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, he hosts the Thinking Atheist podcast. He has a video up um, specifically going through the various things that uh, Christian organizations steal. They, they twist it around. How do they get Jesus out of McDonald's? Uh, That's a does anybody remember the specific one from McDonald's? I don't know, but there was yeah. a... Wow. They take Mountain Dew logos, everything, right. and just turn it into this... It, it is very much a marketing thing, and I don't want to ever say that somebody's being disingenuous about, uh, about their beliefs. Sure. Um, but when we talk about hey, maybe we've lost something. I don't think that I could ever send people to church for that reason. And it may just be a difference mm. in the type of church that we're talking mm. about. Yeah, it may be. I mean, as I said, there, I, I don't want to overemphasize it, but I mean, there are tiny, tiny pockets where what I'm saying is, 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 is not the case. Um, uh, the island in the Outer Hebrides that my father comes from, uh, um, there are about 30 different sects of Presbyterianism, you know, within about a mile, square mile of each other. And, uh, and they're a bit watered down, but uh, not that much. But otherwise, uh, yeah, you, you, as I say, you, you, it, uh, it's fascinating to me because I've been doing this for 20 years or so, and I've just noticed that the entire the entire discussion on ethics, for instance, if you go to the BBC or something and you have a discussion on ethics, 15 years ago, uh, you'd always have a bishop, you know, purple robe, big cross, and so on. And now they just don't go for those guys. And when they do, those, those guys don't have much to add, it seems. I mean, it, it's, which, I mean, you can, you know, uh, regret or otherwise, I don't particularly, but they just, you can see they just don't know how to find a way into the discussions we're now having. And this is something I've actually been kind of standing in opposition to here because you'll watch the news and there will be some member of the clergy on to comment on seemingly everything. I'm exaggerating right. slightly, but there'll be a political discussion and you'll have to get you know, the minister's view mm-hmm. of it. And it happens in the local communities as well as na- you know, the national news. I remember uh, a CNN... Uh, brief piece, but it stuck in my mind forever because the banner behind them was, why do atheists inspire such hatred? Of course, I immediately point out the question is flawed because it presumes that we're the ones inspiring this rather than why is hatred directed at atheists? Because then it could be our fault or their fault or a combination. So asking the wrong questions is is probably one of the biggest problems in the world right now. But they had a panel on to discuss it. How many atheists were on that panel? None. Really? Not one. Two Christians and a Jew to explain to the world that atheists were just really bad at PR right. and that we didn't have any morals to live by. My sense is, by the way, and again, I mean, I mean this is a positive, my sense even in this country is that a lot of the religious leaders, uh, they don't quite want to tell you what they really believe, which is a, a step in the right direction. And my impression still is that most of them know that the culture has shifted or is shifting significantly enough that they know that some of the things they might believe or might have claimed 20 years ago have become total landmines for them. So here's what we'll do. You come down to Austin, we'll take a drive to San Antonio, and you can listen to John Hagee, who runs one of the biggest churches in the United States, talk about how nasty atheists are, and if they don't like God's country, they can get out of the United States, boy. He must be about the only one who hasn't been caught with a rent boy. It's haven't, they, haven't they all, almost all, and I, and I, I notice any, and late friend Christopher Hitchens used to have a great riff on this, that you, you know, whenever you saw any of them holding forth on moral issues, you just make a note, and before you, you know, knew it, you'd find they'd maxed out the credit card trying to pay some rent boy, uh, you know, it's, it, the scandals are... Uh, Almost consistent rule. 
this, so this I'm amazed actually, Hagee, I don't, I don't know what the laws of defamation are like in this country, but I'm amazed no, Hagee you're fine. is already not. Yeah, well, it's, and, and he's just one of many examples. There, there's some that are, and this is another problem with the internet. There's a, a, a pastor, I'm not even going to bother saying his name, because um, he's already gotten too much publicity. Tiny, tiny church. And yet, broadcasts over the internet, which gets him all kind of attention, mostly from atheists who want to just say, oh my gosh, this guy is terrible. I don't know that they're, I don't know what percentage of, of, of church-going Christians actually care what this guy says, but he's awful I mean, with regard to women and everything else. Uh, but when we, you know, clearly there's going to be differences. I wonder, I, I wonder if how much of, of the differences that we're seeing are actually related to differences in culture. Mm. Because I have, I have some rather troubling uh, questions related to culture. And as you've spoken a lot about issues related to multiculturalism, I figured maybe we could address some of that because sure. what does it mean to say British culture, right. Western <laughs> culture? Is there even enough mm. uniformity of value for that to be a meaningful mm. phrase? And what is it that we we should be worried about losing yeah. if that's diluted. Yeah, that's a, a huge one. We're all trying to think about this at the moment. Uh, and there are versions of it that sound nicer than others. Some are horrific. Uh, we have this big discussion now, you know, what is our culture, what is Britishness, what is... And every country in Europe is having that discussion. And I, I hear it here, I hear it in Canada. Uh, sort of constant self-examination. There's nothing wrong with that in a way, although it can cause what I regard as being a kind of breakdown. I mean, if, if you said to any individual all the time, you know, who are you, what are you, what they, I mean, you'd, you'd, you'd end up on the couch quite fast. And I think it might be the same for societies. If you just keep asking what you are rather than just getting on with it, you can kind of instigate an increased nervousness. I think my instinct is to not care. Right. I, I, I'm happy to adopt whatever labels apply to me and to explain what those labels are, but there's nothing about me. Um, this actually bothered my wife a little bit when I said so, because she's, she's a little more, she cares a lot more about her heritage and her history and the, and the people from, right. you know, the, the, the Appalachian Mountains, or the Smoky Mountains and things like that, and, and what those people have gone through. And I don't want to be just dismissive of history. But, you know, one of, one of my ancestors was the preacher who was the founder of one of the first three Baptist churches that became the Southern Baptist Convention. And apart from it being novel, I don't care about that. Right. But there are also people in my past and cultural ties I could make that I would be, uh, th that I don't view as negatives. Right. But they're not me. No, but uh, th there's a, another French philosopher, uh, Alan Finkelkraut, who recently said in an interview something I was very struck by. He said, we in France used to think that our, what we had was worth taking around and giving to the rest of the world. And then we retreated from that idea. And he said, now we're in a position of thinking, can we at least still have it for ourselves? Um, and I was struck by that because, again, it, it might be a thing of, depending where you are and what you've seen, but I, I, given some of the things that France has gone through in recent years, some of which I write about in the book, you know, multiple really terrible, terrible terrorist attacks and assassinations and so on, I, I, I can see why they are getting nervous and wanting to address some very fundamental principles. You know, is what we have in the secular French state, which allows for religion, but you know, now is dealing with new problems, is it is it all vulnerable? And I know a lot of people who feel it is. And I suppose another thing, I mean, I spend a lot of my life as a journalist traveling, uh, not just, you know, across this country and North America and across all of Europe, but uh, the Middle East, the Far East, and mm -hmm. Africa, and so on. And there is, an in, there is a definite feeling you get in certain places of, well, uh, I, I don't want to force my own... Uh, view of my own society on this, but this is very different, and it reminds you, therefore, that what you have is unusual. Um, and I suppose that at different times, people become more aware of how 
got to be careful how he says, but how lucky we may be in this country and in the country I'm from, for instance, that, that we're even within this discussion and freely able to have it and so on, and that some things down the road might, might stop that being the case. So I think that there are moments when societies become kind of febrile like that. Uh, let me give an example. I mean, if any of you have ever been mugged or seen something terrible on the street... You know, We're in New York. So... <laughs> Um, it, it, it changes the way you look at people for quite some time afterwards, and maybe forever. Yes. Uh, if you've seen anything really brutal uh, in the middle of a sophisticated, cultivated place, it, it will fundamentally change the way you, you, you look at everything afterwards, and the way you look at people. And, you know, this is the case with uh, conflict zones, war zones I've been in. You know, you... you it's not just that you come back from those places thinking, my God, I've got an idea of how lucky we are to have this settlement we have, but also why people who are from such places have an ex... Well, but at this way, have, a, have one less layer of skin than everyone else and feel certain things early. And, um, and that's the case in certain countries in, in the West at the moment, and that's partly what this book is about, that certain countries, France being one, are really re-evaluating some of this because they are, they are seeing futures that they want to avoid. I, I can see that. I, I, first of all, I, I recognize that you know, there are people who are going to have experiences that are going to change the way they view things. That doesn't change whether or not their view is accurate. Sure. But when it comes to this idea that we need to protect our culture, mm. whatever it is, from some other culture, that, that just doesn't seem to resonate with me for any reason, because maybe it's because I'm, I'm you know, the standard, generic, privileged, white American dude who doesn't care that much about his past, but I view things in terms of there's, there, is, there are right answers and wrong answers to how to do things. And different views of what was right and wrong have existed in different cultures. Sure. But we know that some of them were wrong. You know, it's, and I don't think either one of us is a remotely so, yeah. a moral relativist. Sure. That is the thing that I want to hold to. What, what I view as the value of secular humanism, the value of basic freedoms, um, if I have a town and a bunch of people start moving to my town, and they're bringing their cultural stuff. I don't have any fear that they're going to kill off my culture mm -hmm. because anything that's worth value to me, I'm going to protect anyway. And I, I advocate for the, for the freedom for them to engage in and support and value their culture right up to the extent that it impedes on right. the, the secular, reasonable, Absolutely. scientific founded you know, laws yeah. and things it's like that. It's like a boundary beating. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you've got to beat these boundaries quite hard, allow a lot to go on within it. But, but yes, and once certain lines are crossed, you've got to, you've got to take a, a stronger view on it. Th that, that, by the way, I mean, I hark on about it. It may not be of much interest, but this is why France obsesses me, because w within one year, they had the massacres at Charlie Hebdo, the most satirical, uh, secular, atheist paper. They had the massacre of most of the staff of that magazine and also a, a priest beheaded at the altar in Rouen as he was saying mass. If that extremity of things can happen in a culture in quite a short space of time, that is, that is the sort of thing that would return you to the fundamental questions. And as I say, one of the fundamental questions all the time is, is what we have the sort of natural default position of humankind, or is it a pretty unusual thing caused by quite unusual factors? Uh, and I, at any rate, take the second view, and therefore think that, w from the secular tradition and others, you've just you've got to be aware of it, at the very least, to make sure you don't piss it away. I think, I think one of the things that uh, this is another difference from you know two sides of the pond, uh, and we talked about this very briefly, is that people will contact me on the show and say, "Oh, you spend all your time talking about Christianity. That's all you talk about, Christianity, Christianity. Why would you do that?" because it's a call-in show, and that's what people are calling in about. 
Uh, first of all, it's also my background. Well, you don't, you don't talk to us about Islam at all. And I was like, well, actually, we have many, many times, and mm. uh, there are occasionally Muslim callers. Uh, there's one of them who I'm fairly sure I, I made cry, even though that wasn't my intent. Um, but we address those things, and yet the thing that I keep trying to point out to people is that while I might agree that when it comes to religions worldwide, Islam might be the single most, have the, the, the single most dangerous ideas and, yeah. and be the greatest risk worldwide, but that doesn't mean it's the greatest risk in the United States sure. or in Texas or in Austin. Sure. And you've spoken a, a, a great deal about um, Islam, and I think that there are different things going on in the UK that we don't see here. I sure. mean, Muslims in the United States, I mean, apart from the general fear that has been instilled in everybody, which I have, I think is at least exaggerated for us, um, but I couldn't say that for everybody. There's, there are Muslims in Dearborn that are, you know, drinking and getting tattoos and, and you yeah. know, they've been, that, their version of Islam has been uh, poisoned probably for the good by the, mm. the secular and perhaps even Christian culture that they're surrounded by. I once, I once uh, was with a pretty devout Muslim friend and he'd been fasting for Ramadan and he broke the fast with me in a pub with a pint of beer. <laughs> so I thought it was a, a happy meshing of cultures. And so when well, we see these changes, and, and granted, yeah. I don't know, and, and you're free to tell us what we don't know about how things are, are much more in conflict with, with regard to people trying to impose their version of Sharia law yeah. in conflict with UK laws. And yeah, there is, there is some of that, and um, it, some of it's exaggerated, but a lot of it is, is real and is there. And I mean, I, I give the example of you know, the de facto blasphemy law that now exists across Europe. Um, I mean, it's not just Charlie Hebdo. Uh, quite a number of colleagues and, uh, and friends have been shot at in recent years for for blaspheming Islam, and uh, that's in in 21st century Europe. And it it's it's something which I, at any rate, and a number of other people, refuse to shut up about because we think it's intolerable that that should be the situation. And the oddity of that is that. You know, uh, um, if, you, if, if there were to be anyone who decided to kill Michael Palin tomorrow because of the life of Brian, I strongly urge this is not something I think should happen. Yes. Um, but if that were to happen, we just, you, you, the whole culture, everything would, would turn on whoever did that. There would be no ifing and butting. There'd be no kind of, well, you've got to understand the offense he caused. You know, we'd just, we'd just be saying no. And that, that isn't the case with this other religion in this situation, partly because people are worried about uh, allegations of bigotry, partly because they're worried that, you know, it's kind of punching down and uh, one of the motifs of the time on this and that you might be upsetting a beleaguered minority and so on. But a third of UK Muslims polled after the Charlie Hebdo attacks said that they had some sympathy with the attackers. A third. Um, you know, I happen to be gay, and uh, you know, I, I'm not delighted by some of the uh, uh, attitudes you can still hear from churches here about homosexuality. But you know, in my own country, there was a poll in 2009 that found among British Muslims, zero percent thought that you should be tolerant towards homosexuality. And a poll taken two years ago found that the majority of British Muslims wanted being gay to be made illegal now. So that's the sort of thing where you start to, you just start to worry. Okay, we've seen this off from one direction. What if, what if it comes in another? And what if it benefits and gains from the fact that people are basically not primed to deal with it anymore? There's a, there's a documentary on uh, Netflix, because I watch tons of documentaries on Netflix, especially when I'm on the road. Um, and it's called Welcome to Leith. And it is about a bunch of Nazis or neo-Nazis who moved to a town somewhere in, I don't know, Wyoming, Montana, someplace, and essentially tried to take it over. Right. And it's really eye-opening because 
it makes you wonder, well, what would happen if they tried to do this in my town? Now, it would take a lot of them to take over, you know, Austin or New York or whatever. Mm. But in a small town, if you had a, a massive group of people show up with a particularly dangerous ideology, mm. such that they could actually take over the city council, that they would become the dominant voting bloc. Right. What protections do you have? Right. In this case, um, I, I'm interested in, in, and we're looking at exploring this as a project, there are a number of towns that have been taken over by religious ideologies. There right. are towns that are almost exclusively Mormon or Hasidic Jew. And I have concerns about the constitutional rights right. of the individuals who live in those towns. Sure. Because the, the, in, the, in the states, the default is, oh, well, that, you, know, they, you really can't have any power. You know, because we've got the Constitution right. and it's there to protect us. And uh, as a reminder, y you can in fact run for office anywhere in the United States if you're an atheist. Please stop spreading around that thing of right. my state constitution says you must believe. Yes, that was all settled by the Supreme Court in the 50s and then fought a couple other times as well. But you can run for office. Mm -hmm. But we had to fight it in court just yeah. to show what the Constitution says. Yeah. And if they could take over a town, I get why people are terrified of that. Mm. Wouldn't it be a, a, a more practical solution? I don't know how this applies in, in the UK, but to just make sure that our laws are such yeah. that people can exercise their religious freedom, but they can't, you know, th there's the old joke about the, the Constitution, two, two wolves and a sheep are arguing over what's for dinner. And the Constitution, or the democracy is what allows them all to vote, and the Constitution is what guarantees that the sheep's not going to be dinner. Yeah. And it, it seems that we can enforce those ideas so that people can have their preferred culture, provided it's, can, it can coexist yeah. with the surroundings. Yeah, the, the, moment, the moment that that's what we're really struggling with across Europe at the moment, is, is to work out where the, where the moments are where you tread over the rights of others in a way that's unacceptable, and also then what you do about it. Because this is, you know, it's a dialogue of the demented at the moment where um, society says, you know, there are some things we really strongly believe in, and if you don't believe in them, well, please do. It, you know, it's not, it's not very assertively made. There's a sort of, well, what happens if I don't? Well, please do. You, 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 there's no follow-up. It starts to look like war and conflict, physical violence, ends up being inevitable if you can't yeah. come to a reasonable... Yes, and some people do fear that's the case. I, I, I don't take as apocalyptic a view as that, but um, we, we, there's a long way for this to run, and it doesn't all go in a good direction. I know that I have uh, probably 50,042 <coughs> questions uh, left for you, so we we'll have to continue another time. But I've also noticed that it's been uh, shockingly almost an hour, um, even though it feels like 20 minutes. Um, can I ask a question? You, you can. I was, you may. I spent, uh, sorry to walk into your Q&A time, but um, I spent part of this morning wa wa watching uh, your event with Jordan Peterson a couple of days oh, yeah. ago. I'm doing some events with him in uh, London coming up. Um, and I was fascinated by it. Um, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts about it that I might have missed. Um, Has anyone here seen it? Well, probably quite a few people, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's an amazing conversation, I think. And I, I, I put out a video that on, on my uh, Atheist Debates channel, giving most of my thoughts to it. I, I am still confused and, and more than a little irritated. Right. Because I know that he had, had conversations with Sam Harris, and the first one was, was awful and painful because yeah. they couldn't come to some understanding about what truth was. Yeah. And for me, truth is that which comports with reality. Done. Um, or at least that's the truth I care about. Once we start talking about oh, well, it's true for me, or it's true in a metaphorical right. sense. I realize that you can inspire people and even educate them with analogies and stories and things, but I care about whether something's really true. There, there's a, a gentleman that messaged me on Twitter, and he's written a big piece about this thing that I did with Jordan because he thinks I'm just monumentally wrong about what people actually believe. 
about the existence of God. And he's like, uh, most people, you know, who, are, who believe that God exists don't actually believe that God exists. And I just think that's monumentally arrogant and dismissive. How, how dare you? I mean, there are probably people who have a metaphorical view of God that's fine for them, or or that they believe in, but I know what I grew up with. I know what's sure. popular and evangelical and fundamentalist. If you go up to them and say, you don't actually believe that there's a God, you, you'll find out fairly quickly that they are at least willing to defend the idea that they do. They might even thump you for Jesus. They might, yeah. Punch me in my fat face for Jesus. That was one of my favorite <laughs> threats. Uh, but when I, when I look back at, at the discussion, uh, there were things that I loved about it in, in the sense that we were, you know, it's frustrating to me that I can sometimes have conversations with people I disagree with yeah. much more easily than I can with, for example, some of my friends on the left who've decided that because I'm not willing to punch people uh, for, for saying things that are awful, that I'm a Nazi sympathizer and, and will go out of their way to say this. Right. So it, it's frustrating because I, I disagree with, I don't think Jordan values skepticism. He kind of scoffed at it under his breath. And I wish I would have addressed that more. I think that's the, the biggest regret from the conversation that I have. But I was happy with that we didn't spend a whole bunch of time talking about truth, mm. except that it concerns me that with the fuzziness of, of how he talks about it, that maybe every single objection I had can be dismissed by saying, well, he didn't mean that true in reality. When he says, you can't quit smoking without a mystical experience, that atheists would actually be murderers. Um, yeah, the, the reference to crime and punishment. Yes. Yeah, that was very interesting, you know, yeah. And in, in, in I'm still not convinced of what he believes about the reality that we, as right. far as I can tell, share. But the, to say that Soviet Russia was a secular humanist... I could see that was a bit that really got on your tits. It did. <laughs> yeah, because you can say it's atheist, and I'll agree all day long. And it was all, you, you could also say that it was, you know, you, you could try to make an argument that it was because of atheism, yeah. but you can't really get anywhere from atheism to therefore we should kill people and have this particular side. You might as well start with his mustache and say, you know, you know mustachioed dictators are awful. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was fascinating. And I, it was really interesting, the, the points at which you really were clearly at, at, at loggerheads. One was that, that, that issue. The, the, a thought occurred to me, though, that, that, that Jordan clearly has a, a, a pretty bleak, you might say, realistic view of human nature and what it does when it's unleashed. And I share some of that. Uh, um, but it, it, it's possible that that was one of the things that was playing out underneath that claim of his, which is... Um, you see, sometimes see this, by the way, among very conservative people, that, that, that they come to quite rigid uh, feelings about things because they actually themselves intuit where they might go unleashed. And that seemed to me to be sort of abundantly there in, in what he was saying. And I, I, find by, I find his attitude towards religion fascinating. He, he reminds me of, a, of the philosopher Roger Scruton a bit because the Scruton... I think if he's written a lot about religion, but I think that if, if you really dug down and you said to him, for instance, you know, do you believe in the physical resurrection? He wouldn't, he would want to not answer that question. And that's what and I Jordan think does. that's where Jordan is as well. And I, I don't, I'm not, in, I'm not um, putting any, any views onto him that I think are dishonest, but I think that he has a, a real fear of saying something which he thinks would cause damage in a way if he did it. Well, that's, that's, one, that's the one question that I asked him that I had prepared ahead of time based on what I knew, and that was, what is it that you fear we will lose if right. people give up a belief in a God? And he started with, well, we'll lose the, the narrative, the metaphorical substrate mm -hmm. of the narrative, blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't tell me anything, because it doesn't tell me what of the narrative is of value that we're losing. Right. And then when I pressed on that, he just said art, as if there's not, ton well, the problem is, is that I could say there's tons of art from, from atheists, except that he also doesn't seem to think there are any atheists. Right. He thinks everyone is religious and that people are just professing atheism, but they've made, none of this meshes with, certainly, certainly it's, it reminds me when 
I'm in debates with Christian apologists, and they say, um, oh, you're not really an atheist. You, you, you actually are just uh, publicly denying that you exist. You, you believe in a God. Uh, or you, you actually know that a God exists. And that comes from, I mean, I did a debate with Sai Ten Bruggenkate, who's a presuppositionalist, and that's his big thing. We, we all know that God exists, including you. You're just you know, lying or whatever. And he's mocked for it. And yet in reality, Jordan did exactly the same thing, essentially saying, you are all, a, you, are all you atheists are uh, professing atheists that, you know, a real atheist would be a cold-blooded mm. killer who would, you know, rationalize mm. and justify this way. You can't have a moral foundation that is secular. Uh, and he tried to use AI. Anyway, I don't wanna go through the yeah. whole e evening, but it was essentially the same thing I get from unschooled, uneducated apologists yeah. on behalf of a much more strict view of religion. And that's why earlier, you may be right about what he's afraid of. Mm -hmm. And I tried to get to what he's afraid of. But when you were talking about suggesting that we may have lost something and mm -hmm. encouraging people to go back to church for that, I didn't know how similar those things were. Mm -hmm. I no, think I am, a, I am a difference. Sli I'm slightly towards his direction somewhere. I mean, I just, I don't want to belabor this, but just one example. Um, a little while ago in, in uh, uh, after talk, uh, a, a young man, a student, came over to ask a question afterwards. And, uh, and he said, uh, uh, this was a real warning flash, you'll know this. Well, he, he said, I don't understand why you don't talk about IQ differentials. Because uh, you're you know, Douglas Murray and uh, not Charles Murray? Y y yes, exactly. <laughs> and there's no relation. Um, <laughs> Uh, but he said, I don't understand why you don't talk about IQ differ differentials. It's an interesting subject that it might be. It's not a specialism of mine and, uh, and so on. But it's also something more than that. And you often find this in conversations with people. You, 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 you unearth something you thought or were worried about, which you just hadn't found the right way of dressing. And, and, and I was sort of trying to dodge this young guy because it's, it's, to me it's a little bit like somebody coming over to me and saying, you know, why don't you ever talk about the Jews? <laughs> moving swiftly on, you know, um, um, and, uh, but, but this young man who said this to me, I was, I was sort of struck, he kept pushing at this, and I realized that I had a number of reasons for wanting to dodge this, and, and well, not just it wasn't my specialism, but I ended up saying to him that, look, you may want to keep delving into that, and so on, but I said, first of all, I'm just not sure what you can do about that. And secondly, I said to him, I, I finally realized what it was. I said, I just would feel nervous about a future in which people were really interested in IQ difference and where we lost a sense of, in a religious or atheistic sense, the sanctity of the individual. And I just, it, it clarified for me that sometimes you see how a pile up can happen and you didn't realize that was why you didn't want anything to do with it. But that was the case with this young man, I'm sure. It's There's people who press on a, a number of issues. My, I, I'm exactly with you. One of the reasons that I'm advocating so much uh, in, in this year and more than the past, I mean, you know, I'm an atheist, but I'm also a secular humanist, and, and I also right. value human life and human dignity. Yeah. And as, a, as somebody who is given IQ tests as a, as a kid and, yeah. and had specific things done to me as a result of, of those scores. Uh, I know people with IQs higher than mine who are boneheadedly stupid yeah, yeah, yeah. and people who have incredibly low IQs who are brilliant at things. Yeah, and, a, and, and I care more actually. about what people believe yes. because the beliefs inform the actions and mostly I care about whether or not those beliefs are reasonable. Yes. Um, because I, I want to make sure that, you know, I've, I've said I want to believe as many true things, as few false things as possible. That's me cribbing Hume in a, in a more hip fashion. Uh, but it, it's true, and you have to have both parts of that. And it seems to me that any time we start trying to quantify yes. the value of people, doing math with souls, doing the yeah. collateral damage math, doing the what's your IQ, how many Twitter followers do you have, yeah. how many, all of these things distract right. from whether or not what this person has said is reasonable and accurate. And you, and you always get to that position that any avid reader uh, will always 
be confronted by at some point, which is that somebody you know who's never read a book can be the loveliest person you know. That's not a discouragement from reading, by the way. No. <laughs> And or indeed buying books. Especially as we have uh, The Strange Death of Europe. <laughs> on, on that note, I want to get, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to some questions from you guys, because you guys have, may have way better questions than I was going to come up with at all. Uh, but thank you so much for doing this, no, and we'll get some questions here from folks. There are microphones up at uh, either one of these. And uh, I think they'll bring, I don't, I don't know what the, the lighting change is going to be, but you can come up to the mics. A couple of reminders. Uh, after we're done with the Q&A, uh, Douglas will be out to sign books and I'll be out to shake hands because I don't have a book to sign yet. But also, questions end in a question mark and they don't begin with your life story or your dissertation. Those who are familiar with me from the atheist experience um, know that I will hang up on people and if you think I can't do it live from the stage, you are mistaken. <laughs> But uh, we'll start here with you, sir, if you can. You don't, you don't have to say your name, but uh, who the question's for, or both, or whatever. Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, question is open to both, but somewhat more focused to uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Murray. Um, in your book, you refer a lot to the dichotomy of, of identities between Eastern Europe and Western yeah. Europe. I come from, my family is from Eastern Europe, from Romania, oh. where we have a very deep a relationship to perhaps not being particularly observant in religion, but being Eastern Orthodox, um, many of our saints fall into very much this idea of protecting Europe from the Ottoman attack, for which yeah. we, for hundreds of years, were both subject to 500 years and fought against. Uh, and it's this new type of narrative that, that we do speak about. I'd like to get some more impressions um, on not only how you see that as a potential solution. You speak specifically mm. about Slovakia and, mm. and, and Poland, I, I reckon. Mm. Poland is a little, doing a little bit different thing right now mm. at the moment with their history. But if you see a solution in this sort of, not necessarily virulent nationalism that we experienced in the 90s in places like Yugoslavia, sure. but rather, do you see as a corrective model in Western European identities by saying, as you say, sort of revisit the paths that you've developed from um, mm. potentially in a church? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, basically for this book, I mean, I, as well as traveling for some years to a lot of the countries that people had been fleeing from, uh, both as asylum seekers and as economic migrants, uh, I'd also spent recent years traveling across the continent from north to south, east to west, uh, meeting a lot of migrants, for instance, who just come off the boats the Greek and Italian islands, uh, um, speaking to a lot of refugees, migrants, and so on, and uh, following the conversations all the way up to the chancelleries of Europe. And yes, you're right. I mean, I came to the decision that, uh, the recognition fairly early on that there was a totally different view in the former Eastern European countries and the Western European countries. And uh, look, I mean, this could all get very messy. I have no doubt about that. And I'm um, I'm aware of what in some of these countries not very distant history has been, and uh, we're always walking on precipices of some kind. Uh, I, my view is that the reason why they have a totally different view towards mass migration and other related issues is because not only they had a history for hundreds of years fighting with the Ottoman Empire, pushing them back from the gates of Vienna and much more, but because of what I think of as the 20th century issue. I mean, we in Britain, like you in America, we never had the Nazis in our country. They made it to the Channel Islands in the UK, but you know, we didn't see populations rounded up and sent to the death camps. And- You did um, see a lot of bombs though. We saw a lot of bombs, it's true. And these things do remain in the memory for a long time, and rightly so. And my view is that Eastern Europe learned one of the worst things imaginable, which is that you can have your entire country and your culture destroyed from one direction, and just as you think you might get above the surface and breathe, it gets totally destroyed from another direction. I mean, to have lived under, under fascism and communism in the space of a few decades, and to have only come out of it quite recently, is bound to have an effect on you that is different from your view of the world if you were born and brought up in New Jersey. You know, it's, it's, 
it's going to affect it. And, and, and I suppose the thing it comes down to for me is this, is that, and I, and I am you know, broadly in agreement with what some of the countries in Eastern Europe have done in recent years in this regard. I think they know one of the, what I think was being a very important lesson, which is to be careful with your present and to be careful with your future and not to carry out experiments on your country that you don't know how they'll turn out just to be careful with your future because you don't know you could you could screw it all up in new ways and um, in Western Europe there's a lot of things we're coming across which we never expected to come across because we hadn't planned and it didn't mean any of it to happen and you know uh, um, and I think in Eastern Europe they have a different view so I just say that you know it's not an argument for people being a liberal or being anti-democratic or anything like it I just I think people should be very careful because this is, for most people, the only vessel they have to live in. And if it's screwed up, you've screwed up the only thing they've got. So be careful. This doesn't seem to me to be a very extreme position, but sadly it's regarded by some as being so. But mm -hmm. I, at any rate, still hold to it. Yeah, and, and for clarity, because I've I heard you talk about this before. You're not anti-immigration. No. You are... I'm anti-totally um, unbounded and unrestricted and uncontrolled. People walking in, just, you know, flowing in on boats without anyone knowing who they are by, as happened in 2015, the millions. And I, I've seen the strain it puts on societies. I've seen the strain it puts on liberals. You know, and it, it's... It, it, it's going to be very difficult. And, I, and I'm curious, thank you for your question, by the way. Yeah, thank you very I'm much. Gonna, also, yeah. I'm, I'm deeply honored to, to oh, have well. gotten a ticket to be here tonight. And, uh, well, likewise, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, of a, I don't even know what the right word is. Um, from a pragmatic standpoint, um, I understand there are nations and borders and there are uh, good practical reasons to make sure that we're not just, you know, having wide open borders anybody can cross and we don't know what's going on and where, all this. On the other hand, in the purely impractical utopian sense, I have no actual objection to a one world government, a one planet community where we are about human beings. Mm. I don't think we're anywhere near that as no. far as, but I don't see a problem and maybe this comes from I don't have some cherished culture that I'm trying to protect any more than I'm trying to protect humanity. And I, I, don't, I don't know if there's any practical way to get there. Well, but I could certainly envision, and I don't, I don't mean just to go down like the Star Trek route, uh, but a, 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 a not, not, system where you don't have the border. Yeah, but I mean, uh, I spend a fair amount of time in this country, and it, one of the things I have observed is that not absolutely everybody is happy with your current president. <laughs> Imagine if you were trying to elect a world leader in a borderless world and who you might get. Well, you would actually get President Xi for life. Yes, and, and I would actually, so I, I, I am a fan of uh, other voting principles, a ranked voting system, and I'm a fan of, of other modes of... You uh, say you're in favor of a rigged voting system? Ranked. Oh, ranked. Where you rank, rank your potential candidates. Thank God for that. So, so that you... <laughs> it was you an important thing second. to clarify. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, also, I, I like the idea of, of um, a council with checks and balances. I like the way our, our sure. constitutional system works with checks and balances, but I don't think you need a, a president. And actually, you know, in many places, the, uh, the leader isn't the leader. And so they, I think there's a number of options. Anyway, I don't want to delve off into fantasy land. Was there somebody over here? I can't see you. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, Mr. Murray, in one of your uh, discussions with Sam Harris, uh, he expressed skepticism about you talking to Stefan Molyneux because of oh, yeah. his yeah. Uh, <laughs> sort of fetishism of IQ differences. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering if, Matt, if you had any thoughts about that, about if you think there are limits on who you're willing to engage mm. with or who you think it's appropriate to speak with. Mm. Yeah. Um, that's, that, I love that question, actually. Thank you. Um, there are people that I won't share a stage with again. Um, <laughs> there are two, at least, Ray Comfort and Scythe and Bruingate that I've talked about publicly. There are probably people that I would not share a stage with because my, my view on this is that 
I share stage all the time with people that I vehemently disagree with, mm -hmm. and I share stage from time to time with people that I somewhat disagree with. I mean, we're going to disagree on some stuff. Um, I think that the counter to bad ideas and bad information is good ideas and better information. And I think that if, mm -hmm. if an idea mm -hmm. is bad and seems to be increasing in popularity, that it's almost a moral obligation yeah. to address it. And so I'm in favor of the conversations. There were people who didn't like the fact that I sat down with Jordan. There were people who didn't like the fact that I sat down with you. Mm -hmm. And that said, there are also cases where I have no need to sit down with somebody. For example, Richard Spencer. Now, he's a white nationalist, white supremacist, neo-Nazi, whatever label he's willing to use. Um, I, can give a, I can get up and, and speak about human rights and equality without having to have him on stage to do it. Mm -hmm. And I can also fairly and honestly address the things that he said publicly without ever mentioning him and counter that. If it turns out that those, I, those ideas become popular and they're starting to increase, right. then maybe it is a good exactly. idea for me or for someone to get up and you know, share a stage and let's show the world. Yeah. I have a lot more confidence in let's put the information out there and have the discussions. I have a lot more confidence in the general public's ability to figure out what's going yeah. on. That's often shaken. I'm, the flat earthers, the, the people who are uh, part of uh, various, what I consider cults or quasi cults of personality with regard to some people, it's incredibly frustrating. But I've gotten pretty good at dealing with frustrating things. And the, it's not like I'm not gonna say there aren't any limits, but the limits are based on, on the potential good that it can do versus the potential harm of leaving it alone. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, that specific one, uh, Sam uh, picked me up on, I think I said at the time, it's pretty much it's the same view now, I sort of, you have a conversation with somebody, it all seems to be pretty normal, they throw something in that isn't your thing, which you know, I've had to find out a bit more about since, but I, I sort of ducked that, and Sam quite rightly noticed that I ducked it, because I just, why is he doing that? Now I'm a bit wiser about, as I say, the sort of warning sirens that go off about certain subjects. But, um, but I'm, I'm a great fan of promiscuous conversation. And, um, and, I, and there's one example I'd give in the UK. There's a guy called Anjem Chowdhury who was a very prominent, uh, led a tiny number of British Muslims, but a really very, very vehement and violent group. And um, so, uh, 10 years ago or so, I was challenged through a debate by a student society in London with him, and I said I'd do it, and it turned out to be a front group and things, and there ended up being a kind of riot in the London streets, and uh, uh, the police asked me not to come, but I said, hell, it's my capital city, I'll come. Uh, and uh, in fact, not only did they duff up a colleague, but uh, the police got there in time to get me out, but um, the bit w we did have in the street was very, very helpful. Firstly, because I got him to say something I'd always thought he thought, and he said it in public. And secondly, that on the basis of that uh, event, the terrorist group which he was leading was shut down by the British government, finally. And I know that the security services and the police were taking photos and that in the one year after it, by about a year after that occasion, at least half a dozen of the people who were in front of me with Anjan Chowdhury had been sent to prison for trying to kill people. And I was very pleased that this event had smoked them out and they'd appeared in public and uh, okay, they shouted vile stuff at me and so on. That wasn't very pleasant to have a hundred jihadis against me in the street, um, but it, it turned out to do an immense amount of good. And um, we met on subsequent occasions in slightly more uh, studio-like environments. And again, you could show up what he thought and just the fact that he just wasn't somebody engaging in normal dialogue. He was somebody who had a bunch of people behind him who he was encouraging to blow people up and assassinate them. In, Britain and around the world, and I'm very glad that he's now in prison. 
Not the only one of my enemies who's now in prison, incidentally, but that's another story. <laughs> and that's why I'm not his enemy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, I'm Chris. I'll give this to either of you. And let me just first say that if you're looking for an example of a community to study where a fringe group has basically taken over the entire civil government, Curious Joel here in New York State would be an excellent example. That's one of the towns I was talking about yeah. for filming for the documentary. The, the question is, we seem to have moved as a country, our country, uh, from healthy skepticism where you withhold acceptance of an assertion absent being presented with or finding appropriate evidence to unhealthy skepticism where you reject basically any assertion yeah. that doesn't meet your existing framework of biases. I have to interrupt you right there just because I'm doing the magic and skepticism yeah. tour and uh, I, I, I will never call those healthy and unhealthy skepticism. One of them is skepticism and the other one is cynicism and they're different. Fair enough. Yeah. But th then the cynicism is reinforced by the fact that people gravitate to TV channels, the blogs, the social structures sure. that reinforce their belief structure. How do you challenge that? How do we as a country get back to a situation where reasonable, healthy skepticism is an appropriate way to make decisions? Let me give you one example, if I may, which has been much on my mind recently. Um, Russia. Okay. So I, I've written a lot on foreign policy and international affairs, but Russia happens not to be a specialism of mine, but I'm interested in it. I have quite a lot of friends involved. And something remarkable has happened in recent years. There was a time uh, in the last decade when you just, it was really very hard to alert people to Vladimir Putin's nefarious activities. People didn't really care that much. He, they poisoned somebody on the sushi shop opposite where I was living at the time, but it was like, oh, well, you know, that's the Russians. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so it was sort of hard to wake people up about that subject, about kleptocracy in Russia. And then we got to this weird stage where absolutely everything that happened that some people didn't like was blamed on Russia. Now it's really hard to persuade people that Russia is doing anything. They either say that it is controlling the entire world, every single plebiscite, every vote is organized by the Russians and, and so on, or they just believe that the FSB and its sister organizations are just sort of sitting around throwing paper darts at a wall somewhere in Moscow. And it's very, very hard to find people in between these two places who are willing to pay any attention to specific things that the Russians are doing and have been doing. So that when, for instance, sorry to be local about this, but you know, when in this charming cathedral city of Salisbury, a former Russian spy and his daughter are um, attempted assassination with a really specific nerve agent, you know, you just, people are like, well, it could have been the British government. Oh, yeah, yeah, the British government's very keen to poison people in cathedral cities with nerve agents. Yeah, they're always doing that. But if they wanted to blame it on the Russians, that'd be a perfect way to do it. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a sort of, it looks like a false flag, you know. And, I, I didn't, as I say, and, and I'm not a Russia expert, so I don't, ha I don't have time to look at every single issue of it. I'm just aware that we're losing the reasonable place in which a reasonable discussion would be had. And that's just on one issue. I think, I think the best thing about this is that whatever the solution is, it's already started in part because we're now more aware and talking about, this question comes up almost everywhere we go, uh, or at least me, I'm assuming you get, everybody's concerned about this, or at least a good chunk of people are. And as that concern increases, you'll get people who start to recognize, hey, yeah, the algorithms on Facebook are feeding me all the shit that I want. Right and all the stuff that I clicked on that I liked, and this isn't necessarily true. Or I've been only watching Fox News, or only watching MSNBC, or only watching CNN. I watch all of them, yeah, uh, one of them to laugh at, um, <laughs> and, and be terrified by, because you know I like horror movies. I think the fact that we're becoming aware of this is, for me, a positive sign. There is no easy solution. There are probably people who are going to go to their grave. You know, I've said before that people would ask, you know, how long is it going to be before, you know, religion goes away? And I was like, I, as sad as it is, I think a generation or two might have to die off because there are some people who just aren't going to change their mind. I think that some of that's going to be true for 
misinformation about politics and political regimes, misinformation about uh, cultural phenomenon and, 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 and people's preferences, how they override facts. But the fact that we're talking about it is step one. Mm. I'm not going to be able to give you a solution at all. I took a test. <laughs> this is so sad. I took a test on Facebook that was kind of like, how insulated are you? And it was, I figured, okay, this will tell me how much of a bubble I'm in on Facebook, which was silly of me because it was just another Facebook click thing. And it was, it had questions about movies and politics and all kinds of things. It was wide ranging and, you know, I, I'm, I'm not an expert at that sort of polling at all. Uh, but I'm also not clueless. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have mattered what I would have clicked. It told me that I was in the least bubbly area uh, of anybody, you know, the, the percentage percentile that they tested. And that's when I stopped clicking on any sort of poll stuff like that. The other thing is, I, I joked one time, the solution is to delete Facebook. But I think the solution may be to reset Facebook dump all your friends, dump all your history about it. You don't get to do this, by the way. Facebook would actually need to do this. And it's not just Facebook, it happens everywhere. Um, but I think sometimes, uh, you know, it's, people worry about the reset. Well, this isn't like I'm resetting my life. This is resetting, you know, my online presence. This, this isn't, shouldn't be that much more traumatic than changing my email address, which for a lot of people, I mean, I've had the same one for 15 years or so. But talking about it as a start and people caring about it enough to see that there is a problem that we should work towards a solution for. That's step two. Apart from that, I can't tell you, which was the short answer I should have given at the start of this. <laughs> oh, hello, good night. Hi. Uh, I'm a fan from Brazil. Um, it's a great pleasure to see you both in person. Uh, my question is in regard to Jordan Peterson, uh, especially because he's being so prominent uh, in the media and on YouTube. His book is one of the best sellers worldwide is giving a lot of talks. And although I admire Mr. Peterson's views in, in many um, issues, uh, when it comes to uh, religion, uh, it's quite disturbing for me uh, for being an atheist and everything. Uh, and I would like to uh, hear both of you uh, opinion on uh, the question uh, is you know, since, since Jordan Peterson is so um, influential, is because he's uh, he believes in God and he has these uh, uh, religious uh, beliefs. Is this a threat to the you know skeptical movement uh, way of thinking? Is it a threat to the skeptical movement? No, I think. Well, all right, this is going to be glib and rude, but at least it's honest. I don't think it's skeptics that are actually uh, agreeing with Jordan. Um, or at least not people who are applying skepticism. Uh, it, the thing is, skepticism is essentially, as the last gentleman said, withholding your, your assent to an idea. It, it is, I am not convinced and will not be convinced until there's sufficient evidence to warrant that. That's it. It's not saying this is nonsense. I don't run around, I, I, in many cases, was it, there's, a, uh, there's a line that Richard used um, that's from somebody else, and I'm going to butcher it, but it, it was something about um, your idea isn't even wrong. That it's so muddled and confused that it isn't even wrong. Essentially, it's, 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 it's incoherent and unfalsifiable. I don't know how big of a threat this is. What, I, what I've been trying to do, I did the event, um, and I know Douglas is going to do some events. Sam's done. I think Sam's got like three or four events with him. Um, and hopefully over the course of those, we can get to some clarity ab about, sometimes I'm not convinced I, I even remotely understand what he's advocating for, because I'll be honest, I don't care about metaphorical truths at all. I care about reality. Now, I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm fine with the idea that you can inspire people through this stuff. But I can't tell you how much of a danger it is to anything, because there are fans of, who've written me who say, oh, I'm a big fan of yours, and I'm a big, big, big fan of Jordan Peterson's. I couldn't wait for you guys to sit down and talk. And I wasn't familiar with Jordan, so I kept saying, what is it about him or his ideas that you are a fan of? 
and most of them didn't answer. There were a couple that answered with something that I still didn't grasp, and one of them was pretty much, I just like the way he talks about stuff, and he's really good on psychology. And I'm not here to, to psychoanalyze him or get in his head, but based on, on what he said, I don't know how much danger there is. It may be that this is a, this is a softening of religion. It may be a completely different type of reform. Um, I just wish that I have a difficult time looking at someone who's an apologist about something that's unclear. Because if a word can mean anything to anybody, then it means nothing. Mm -hmm. And so if you say, I believe in God, and you and everybody else have a completely different, you know, God is real, and you have different definitions of God and is mm -hmm. and real, I don't know where you, where you go from there. Yeah, I, I, I agree with some of that. I, look, uh, it's, Then it's, you're partially right. And I'm partially right. <laughs> um, I think that he's doing, done several things, and he's doing several things, which are very important. I don't know if one's allowed to still quote Woody Allen, but let me just try. <laughs> Some years ago, Woody Allen gave an interview in which he was asked about whether he minded not having gone to university. And he said, um, he said he had, because although he'd spent his, his life reading and amazingly wide reader and a wide knowledge, he said he felt that, it was like a bridge, he, he had that bit and he had that bit, but what he hadn't ever got was that. And uh, I knew exactly what he meant. Like, I, I don't have the arc that you can get if you've studied the whole of, I don't know, whether it's literature or law or whatever. You know how you get to there because you came from here and you know the whole route over the bridge. Uh, my view is that a lot of young people, which is who Jordan's mainly speaking to, I think, are people who just, they, they don't know. Like, what, what is this tradition or this civilization or this culture or this this art or this philosophy or any of it. They've, they've, they've been, maybe they've, it's worse if they've been to university these days, but the, 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 everything's been deconstructed. They're told there is no uh, core uh, uh, idea, no core curricula, all this sort of thing. Everything's gonna be taken in its own context. And, and the, the, the world is befuddling to them because it's been presented as more befuddling even than it is, and he's, trying to give these people, and I think pretty successfully is, an idea of what that whole bridge might be. And the second thing I'll just say very quickly is that he is speaking to a, a thing which I, I've written about quite a lot as well, which is this, this sense, again, I don't want to bang on about the Europe aspect of this, but a German philosopher, um, Jürgen Habermas, who I quote in my book, uh, wrote what for me was a very important essay some years ago called The Awareness of What's Missing, where he writes about um, a friend's funeral who is an atheist who um, leaves instruction that there is to be a funeral in a church. There's no, no amen to be said, and there are to be no priests in robes. And Habermas, in basically his most coherent work, in my view, um, sums this up is the fact that he says his friend has recognized the loss of faith and has also recognized that we have not yet come up with anything that remotely goes into its place. Now, lots of atheists say we don't want to fill that place. We don't want to come up with new religions or replacements for religion and so on, fine. But that there is a, that there is a vacuum there, I think, has to be recognized. And my own view is that there is a deep, deep longing that people will have with or without religious answers. And that to, to, to pretend that that is not there is a very big mistake, whether you're a believer or a non-believer. And he appears to be speaking to those deeps. And I, at any rate, think that that is a great service. Uh, I have disagreements with some of the ways in which he answers that. But but this uh, final thought, I mean, this is, 
all the time, there is an, an interpretation of what's happened with atheism over the last couple of decades, which is that, broadly speaking, in the 2000s, people were so worried about, among other things, post 9-11 and so on and so forth, this was, that it had a great run at running straight at the thing. Did a terrific job, Hitch and others, amazing thing. But that, that we are in something that is following that success at the moment. By which I mean that that, that running at the target worked to some considerable degree. But there are a set of questions now which we have to be engaged in which are slightly further down the road. And I, and I think he's involved in that territory as much as or more than anyone. And I'd see no other plausible people at the moment. I, I think I agree with you that he's filling a gap that some people experience. I just don't agree that there's necessarily a gap because I'm happy with taking the good wherever I find it, including within religious doctrines and getting rid of the bad. And so the, the concerns that people have about the vacuum portion, everyone that I've been presented with, I, I, I have at least for me, and it may not apply for everybody else, I don't see a vacuum there. Right. I, I, I have a, a perfectly acceptable moral foundation, absent religion. I think that, and as a matter of fact, not, not only do I think that the vacuum is something that religions have, have created, but amplified. They've, they've done a disservice to, to people in how they deal with death by not acknowledging that it's an inevitable part of life. Um, that if you realize or are convinced that this is the only life you know you're going to get, you might treat people differently the first time around rather than thinking you could make up for it. Sure. It was said once that um, religions poison you and then offer you the cure. And I think that it's more accurate to say, and I've said this before, that religions convince you that you're poisoned and then offer you the homeopathic remedy. And it turns out that there was no poison, that you weren't a bad fallen creature, that you uh, aren't, uh, that your fears about death or loneliness or whatever, these are just the facts of the universe. The universe doesn't care about us, so we have to care about us. And that's where secular humanism comes in. So I agree that atheism doesn't offer anything to fill those gaps, but secular humanism does. But I also agree that there are plenty of people who aren't going to accept that, yeah. and he may be filling a gap. And on that front, I'm a little worried, not that the gap is being filled by something that is uh, terrible or particularly dangerous, but I see some things that are cult-like, and in, in there are people who almost view him as a messianic figure. They, yeah, they don't know what to do with their life, but he can tell them. Sure, but look, that can happen to a range of people. Sure. I mean, I remember at the end of his life, Hitch was concerned about the fact that some people, I mean, I remember there, was, there were people like who, who asked Christopher to officiate at their weddings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is a nightmare. Um, <laughs> you know, and I mean, obviously, yeah, it started to worry him. It would worry anyone. I'm not worrying bloody wedding. I did uh, two weddings. But, I'll never do another. No, I mean, it's... Um, so, so I, mean, I, I wouldn't blame Jordan for, the, for that. It, 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 it can come towards anyone who is presenting a, a comprehensive, deeply thought through, even if they're slightly wrong, you think at times, but a coherent explanation of what we're doing. And I mean, that, that, I, I've sensed this for years, that young people in particular are like, what are we doing? Well, I'm not blaming him for it. Sure. I'm just talking about the effect that, sure. that I see. Um, Got time for another? Yes. Hi, Douglas. Uh, Hi. I know you talked about your rejection of labels. I do think you have some conservative views, even by U.S. standards. Sure. As someone who's center-left, though, I find myself largely agreeing with many of them, and even the few I don't. It makes me pause for a moment. Voices like yours, I think, are surprisingly rare, particularly on the right in media today. And I think part of it is just intellectuals and more articulate folks do not want to risk having to break through the nuance of why they're not xenophobic or racist or hold bad views. Hmm. And they'd rather not volunteer that information, leaving more extreme voices to fill that right. gap. So you talked about bridging divides and getting out of the bubble. How do you achieve that if maybe one side has a steeper price to pay for expressing their views than another? Good question. Um, I broadly think that all this has been made infinitely worse by social media, which is one of the reasons why I don't engage on it. 
a, a certain amount for. I mean, I, I wouldn't go out into the street and invite people to shout names at me. And then, like, if I didn't hear properly, go over to them and ask them to do it clearer. And, um, and in the same way, I don't seek out the sort of mad burlesque of, of the debate or what passes for debate on social media. But um, it's clearly exacerbated because people on, I think, all political sides are increasingly behaving like trolls. So, I mean, you see it all the time. I mean, take abortion. I've got pretty typical European views about abortion. Okay, but when you hear people talking about abortion as if it, you know, there was one like shout your abortion a little while ago. Like, it, at least concede this is a really important moral question, which we have to think about seriously. And you might come to one decision, either or the other. We might be pro-choice like me, but like, d don't don't just try to piss off people who are pro-life. I think pro-life, by the way, I don't like the saying. It's like the other side is pro-death. But anyhow, <laughs> but you see this all over the place at the moment on almost every issue. It's like. My, the people I dis, you know, Lena Dunham says this, so I'm going to say this. You know, Donald Trump said this, so I'm going to run this way. And it, it's just, it's just clearing out all the mainstream. I gave the example of Russia, but I mean, you could do it on almost anything. People that seem to be forming political views, not because they've reasoned themselves into them, but because they want to piss off people they hate. And I just think we have to find a way to do better than this. And that, and it comes back to this thing about not making claims about your opponents that are just demonstrably untrue. I, I mean, I, I have this with, with Sam. Like, somebody said that this a conversation Sam Harris and I had was like Nazism or something. Like, you, you gotta be the most fucking ignorant person in the world to think that Sam Harris, the West Coast yoga-doing, meditating liberal, is a jack-booted Nazi, okay? <laughs> and I make no claim about myself, but you've you got to be, you got to be just, you've got to know nothing to say that. You've got to have not seen anything or been anywhere or read anything, unless what you're trying to do is to clear out the decent liberal ground, okay? And that's what some people are trying to do. I see it all the time at the moment. It's like, we want to get rid of the voices who are plausible, so we'll make totally illegitimate claims about them being Nazis, fascists, white supremacists, and so on, in the hope that we'll throw enough mud at them that they're no longer in the debate. I say, again, you have no imagination of where this goes, because if you've, if you've heard people, I, you, this is another thing we've all seen all the time. When the mainstream media can run roughshod over somebody's entire life and career, and you see it happen, you become very doubting about the next times you see it happen with people who you don't know about. And one, of my, one of my things about this is that if you've heard somebody illegit if you've heard 99 people illegitimately described as Nazis, it's highly likely that you won't believe the hundredth time somebody calls somebody a Nazi, and it's possible the hundredth time it's a proper Nazi. I saw this once in London. I won't go on. I saw this once in London, a debate where a really stupid person I knew was sitting beside me in a debate, and somebody stood up and asked a question. And another friend of mine, who was a Labour MP at the time, said, It's the Nazi lady. Okay. It was somebody who I won't name, but. Yeah friend of David Irving's, this, this person he pointed to. I read a piece by this really stupid person in the Telegraph two days later saying, it's appalling, everyone's calling each other Nazis these days when they disagree. No, she is a Nazi. She actually is a Nazi. But it was like, she'd heard it so many times that she didn't believe it when somebody said, oh no, that's a well-known Nazi. And, and that's sort of where we are. And it worries the hell out of me. I mean. The continent I'm from, we've got some Nazis around, okay? They're, they're like, 
A Golden Dawn in Greece is about as thuggish a fascist street movement as you can get in 21st century Europe. If you claim that there's basically no difference between Golden Dawn and Sam Harris, I think the only thing I, I, I I'll, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm tempted to add nothing, but um, there's one thing that ties to your question, and no offense to Douglas, but I heard him do it, we all do it, but I keep cautioning people against it anyway, even though I'm prone to it, so it's worth getting out there. Argue honestly and stop pretending that you can read people's minds. Yes. When I, I'm as pro-choice as you are going to find, I've debated it, I will call the other side anti-choice, and um, I will demolish their views that I think are actually harmful. But my wife and some of her friends had previously said, ah, the anti-choice people, they just want to control women's bodies, they just want to control sex, they just want to punish women for having a vagina, uh, a uterus, sorry. Boy, I can't believe I got that it's wrong. Not, it's not but, my area. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so uh, and, and I said, don't do that. What you should do is say exactly what the truth is, which these individuals want to implement policies that would have the effect of controlling sex and making women slaves to their biology, et cetera. That doesn't have to be their motivation. Their motivation could be, we want to make sure that every living thing lives forever. And if you misrepresent what their actual motivation is, they get to dismiss you immediately. In the same way that when Jordan Peterson or somebody tells me that I don't actually not believe a God exists, I get to dismiss them because I know me enough to know that they're wrong about that. And so if you stop pretending you can read people's minds and stop pretending you know what their motivations are and instead talk about what they're actually doing and the consequences of those actions, I think you will get a lot farther. There's a lady there. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Sarah. Um, I'd just like to say I'm Jewish. I do believe in God, but I don't think that God um, it discriminates against atheists because he made you guys for a reason. And then um, number two, um, I would like to address the, um, you, brought, you bring up the, bl the blitz. Um, you know, circuitously or, you know, obliquely. Um, I would like to ask, first of all, as an atheist who, ha who, who speaks on religion regularly, weekly, um, do you find that that's a substitute for ministry? Uh, your, fa your family is very strong in ministry. And number two, if you did not have your ministry, what would you have a passion for that kept you going? And what would you do as, as, a, as a vocation? Is you this said, for me? Because I think so, you this is for you and, 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 for, and for you. I was going to say, I didn't bring up the blitz for, at for all. You, so. I know that your, your father was, was, uh, was a Presbyterian minister. Yes? Not a minister, no. He, uh, he, was, uh, he was, but you were. Um, he was a congregant. So. Uh, okay, I, that, I, I, I didn't know what. Sure. There was, your Wikipedia is incorrupt. Uh, yeah, uh, not for the first time. <laughs> Uh, the short version is, uh, I'd have a passion for all the same things that I have a passion for. As far as I can tell, I mean, obviously I can't rewind the clock and, and remove my religious upbringing and everything else. I'd probably have a passion for much the same things I do, for, for learning and educating and magic um, and my, my hobbies. But it, I, the, the values that I have, the, the interesting thing for me was when I found my way out of the religious beliefs, I had to take an inventory of my entire life and why I believed what I believed. Hey, if previously killing people was wrong because God said so, well, does that mean I can kill people? Ah, it turns out, really easy answer, no. And there are good reasons. I'd rather not die, you'd rather not die. It's probably in our best interest to make sure we discourage that sort of thing. So you can have completely pragmatic, even selfish reasons to reach those conclusions. So what about psychopaths? Well, I mean, you don't get to point to the exception that they're not gonna have a reason whether there's a God or not. The better question is why did God make psychopaths? But that's, I would. That's a question for psychology, whether he did or not. Well, um, uh, so anyway, I, I would have a passion for, for much of the same things. Uh, my passion isn't let me destroy religion across the world. It is to, and because I'm not saying there is no God and religions are wrong, I'm saying I'm not convinced there is a God. And every time throughout history somebody's tried to argue for one, it's been logically fallacious and without evidential support. 
is a part. It's not, it's but, not faith, personal faith without judgment is not support? I'm sorry? Personal I, faith without judgment of others is not support? Personal faith without judgment of... You, you, the, the previous, the person who just asked the question about religion dying out, it reminds me an awful lot of, of Oprah's idea about, you know, the, a bunch of old white people have to die out before, before the um, racism is gone. It's a bit of a, um, a eugenic solution. No, it's not eugenics. I'm just saying that we're going to have to wait. I'm, I'm saying it's going to take time, but, that there are some people who... But what if it never dies because people like me teach our children? Well... It may never die. I, as a matter of fact, I don't think it, that it will die. I no. think it would just be diminished to the point where it's no more relevant I, than flat earthers. But I mean, maybe I could just chip in to say that I don't spend all my time um, arguing about religion or telling people to drop their faith or anything like that. True. Um, but, uh, I mean, you asked what else one would do, and I, at any rate, feel rather resentful about this, uh, not towards you, but uh, I feel rather resentful about the amount of time I have to spend on this. Um, having been brought up in, in, in the Christian tradition, and I mean, I'd not, I don't hate it, I don't loathe it, far from it. Um, but I, I, I resent the fact that having, broadly speaking, managed to see the church's role in society reduced to the position which I think it should be in, I feel resentful that now, in the 21st century, I have to spend so much time reading Hadith, and so on. And I think of all the things I would do, and it answers your question, what I would be doing is doing what I did from the beginning, before this all diverted me, which would be for concentrating on my first love, which was literature and art, and writing about that. And the only reason I don't get so much time to do that is because I don't think that the conditions for that to continue to be done are satisfactorily safe at the moment so but the moment Hashem, the moment that Hashem and Allah are the same thing? I believe in what do you believe that Hashem and Allah are the same God because you just talked about hadith and not about um, say Talmud well no because I mean I can assure you madam that if if people were chopping off people's heads in my country and citing the Talmud I'd be reading a lot more of the Talmud and of okay. Jewish law and I'd be engaging myself far more in that. It's just that, you know, in the last year, it's been multiple times that people have, for instance, walked across London Bridge slashing at women's throats, shouting, this is for Allah. So I find myself unable to spend as much time on poetry as I'd like. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a frustration I have, which I hope to get over someday. So when you start being able to read essays from me on literature rather more, you'll know the world's safe. Not, not, all, not all believers <laughs> Do we have time for one I, more? I and then... Actually, that has to be the last oh, question uh, they're telling me. Uh, so thank you, and thank you everybody else. Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you. That was a great pleasure. Thank you. Man. Thank you very much. That was a great pleasure. A round of applause for Douglas and Pangburn Philosophy for putting thank this you. on. We'll see you out there somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.